Well, my name is Dorothy Lazor. My Mohawk name is Olote uh, Garihuahue. I'm from the Deer Clan, Wageneyotlonu. And I was born in Akuzasne. I grew up in Akuzasne. But I did teach in different communities within our Mohawk nation. If you take a look at the map here, it gives you an idea of where our Mohawk nation is located. And you see you have Akuzasne, you have uh, Ganisadauge up top, Ganawage, uh, Wahta Gibson, Tainanega, Ganat Johalege, our Six Nations community, uh, Oswego is further down. And we're close to the New York State border, so we do have uh, Mohawks living in the uh, New York area. The pointer might not be working. Oh, here it is. Okay, so, Akuzasa, so this area here is where we're in, right, right near the Canadian border. Now, I live on the uh, Quebec side of our community. It's called Akuzasne, and we have an Ontario section and New York. Uh, before I go into the presentation, I just want to mention that uh, during the summer, I looked at this title and it said, Emergency, Our Languages Are in an Emergency State. And I was flipping through the um, introduction and I said, or the write-ups, I said to myself, that's a good conference to go to. So I says, well, I'll go speak to our authorities and see if we can, I can manage to go to this conference. I no sooner stepped into the office and I got a phone call from INA asking me if I would be the presenter. And I said to myself, oh, I wanted to go and learn something, but I could not say no to her. So I accepted the challenge. Okay, just to give you an idea of the history of what has happened to our languages, if you take a look down here, prior to 1659, 1659 to 1759 was the Jesuit influence. Now, at that time, our communities, everyone spoke Mohawk in that time period. Now, 1859 to 19, eight, no, 1959 is where it was the beginning of our language loss. And it was small, it was like individuals that were losing the language. Okay, in 1959 to 1979 was the introduction of Mohawk language in the school system as a subject or as a core. So it was taught like 20 minutes a day to half an hour to an hour to an hour. The white paper policy came out in 1972, and that's when the introduction of the language was implemented in the school system. Nineteen eighty, immersion, grade one was introduced. It was actually started in nineteen seventy nine at the nursery kindergarten level. And that was in the federal school system because we still were under uh, the federal government. If you take a look here, 2000 to 2016, uh, there was a lot of immersion schools and a lot of immersion training, and a lot of uh, training for uh, immersion teachers. I see everybody. Have a look at the decline, how fast it went. From about 1972 to to date, the language has gone, has gone right down. I would say we have about maybe a thousand speakers left. Okay. 
the Jesuit influence back in uh, 1659. Now, when they came in into our communities, the only language spoken was Kanyageha, Mohawk. And the, some of those Jesuits learned the language to the extent that they developed some grammar books, they developed um, hymn books, song books during their, during their days. But up until, let's say, 1959 is when the, the Jesuits started coming in and the language spoken in the community was English, so they didn't continue learning the language. Kanyageha language is a subject in Kanawagi started in 1972. We had um, language teachers from nursery, kindergarten, grade one to grade six, and at the high school. In 1971, I was asked to teach Mohawk language at the high school level in this community. So it was like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, three hour course for the university and two hour sessions. Now if you take a look, just looking at the time, if you see 30 minutes, that's about 12 days of Mohawk a year. If you calculate, if you do the calculations on that. Now at the high school level, they have more like 45 to 70 minutes, but still it might be, that might total to maybe 20 days of Mohawk in a year. So Akuzasne had a core subject program established in the public schools in the 1970s. And in Tainanega, 1990 to 1995, core subject program at, from nursery to grade 12. And they also established adult language courses, a preschool, early childhood immersion, and an early elementary education program. Now, in 1995, the last fluent speaker in Tainanega passed away. So, and then some other some of the people got together and they wanted to learn the language and they established these immersion uh, schools and they established an adult immersion and some of the people became speakers and they went back in to speak to uh, teach in the, in the core programs. Curriculum teams develop materials. We had a strong curriculum team in the Ganawage back in 1981-82 we had about t anywhere from 12 to 20 people working on curriculum. And it involved elders, it involved um, teachers, curriculum writers, artists that um, we worked with in order to develop the curriculum from nursery to grade six. The immersion program in Ganawaga had gone up to grade six, but in the last few years it went back down to grade four, simply because we lost teachers. And then from there, at the high school, it went from grade nine to grade, grade eight to grade 11. Because in Quebec, they only go to grade 11 at the high school. But we collected all our legends, our stories, in order to teach it in, within the system. Okay, so, can you get a language immersion, 1980 in Ganawage? Now there's, um, there's one school in Gantawaga had an immersion from nursery to grade six. And what happened was there was one parent whose child could not get into the immersion because he missed it by four days. The cutoff date was October 1st and he only turned four in October 5th, something like that. She turned on her heels and walked out of the building and she said, I'm going to have an immersion school. She contacted every parent in, the, in, uh, in Ganawage whose child did not make the deadline. And I think within three or four days, she had almost 15 to 20 students, uh, kids, children, little ones. And they established their immersion school. They did fundraising. And they got a teacher, somebody who could speak Mohawk to them. And they started, she started that program. That program is still going. In fact, it's up to grade six. And I was speaking to her last summer, and she said, Dorothy, my, do my son is a speaker of Mohawk. <laughs> when establishing an immersion program, you have to be highly motivated. 
any person, any of our native people who get into immersion or language learning, you have to be highly motivated in order to do this type of work. It takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of time. In fact, your, your whole life is focused on developing materials, becoming speakers, and creating your curriculum in order to implement it in that school system. We also have uh, an immersion program on the Akwazasne on the American side. And I think they st started maybe a bit later than the one in Kahnawake. It got, and these students here, when it started, were the students who did not make the regular school system. And they started in the school and then finally they changed it to language. Uh, and to date this program goes up to grade 10 total immersion. Sometimes, it, I think this year went back to grade nine, but they have nursery to grade nine total immersion. Okay, Ganesadage. Uh, immersion program for nursery Mohawk languages and as a core subject taught from nursery to high school. And then Ganyonge language is taught all day in math, science, geography, and language arts. Adult immersion program for the parents who are trying to speak the Mohawk language. In Tandanega, they began a preschool, early childhood immersion program, and an early elementary education program. Uh, when I went to teach in Tandanega in 1991, uh, they only had one fluent speaker left, and she was 95. She died about, in 1995, she, died. she passed away. I worked with her for a while to go visit her, just to get the dialect. Uh, it wasn't much different, but there was a few sounds. Um, and they've started immersion programs, and they've created a few immersion uh, Mohawk speakers. Akwazasad, we have um, band council schools established. They established immersion programs beginning in 1989 at the nursery level. Eventually, you went to grade six. Uh, now the transition to English at grade five. Oswego, Cayuga, and Mohawk immersion program run simultaneously throughout the school to grade 12. An adult immersion program was established in the early 1990s for people who desired to relearn the Mohawk language. And they, he, this one particular individual, he relearned the language himself, established an immersion program where he takes about 15 students every year and they relearn the language. I think that program runs for two years and they become speakers, pretty fluent in the language. Our band council system in Akwazasna also has um, a program where they teach the um, band employees. Okay, uh, 2000 to 2003 in Kahnawaga, they had an adult immersion teacher training. It was established through McGill University. Students achieved fluency in one year, and many had, had been immersion students through the uh, Kahnawaga system. Uh, students received 30 credits towards a certificate, teaching certificate, and then some of them continued on to a bachelor of ed in teaching, and then came back into the school system to teach. Um, that year that we did the immersion with the adults, out of 26, 25 became fluent and went back into the school system to get a teaching job to teach the younger kids. Uh, 2003, 2006, Akuzasne, Adult Teacher Training Program, a three-year Mohawk immersion program funded by ANA. Uh, 10 people, um, they're tasked with relearning the Mohawk language. And many went on to become um, teachers in the um, Freedom School that we have on the American side. Nineteen ninety-seven. We also um, included um, lessons on the radio and the newspaper. Uh, we have we weekly Mohawk lessons written and recorded since 1997, available in the newspaper, on the website, and on the radio. 
2006, we had a Can 8 computer-based program, lessons and stories, songs, and the history recorded to computer. Students could hear and practice the Mohawk language. 2008, we had community classes during the day and in the evenings. Uh, 2010, we had one hour classes for band employees. And this is still going on, the, the bottom one. And we, we pulled our teachers from, some were retired, we call, called them back in to do this one hour class. Mm. Now our Ozzie the Wada program, Sa'uyela, Kari Huagelu, Yuli Huandazilu. Now, to promote the restoration of land based cultural practices and traditional economic activities within the community in the Mohawk language. Four areas of traditional cultural practices is what we're looking at. We, the the uh, group did fishing and river use, medicine plants and healing, hunting and trapping, horticulture and traditional foods. And all those four areas. We have uh, two masters, and they have four students each, and they go into the, these fields, and they, they uh, hunt, and they, we include the language in all those activities. And we have two masters working with four people. So the Cultural Apprentice Program learning and teaching through direct experience in a natural environment and the passing of knowledge to the younger generations. The language goal, to increase the number of fluent language speakers. Uh, knowledge of the goal, the apprentices would reach a point where they possess the skills of a master and can then in turn take on a teaching role in the Mohawk language. Hopefully they'll be able to, but the, it's a four year program, and at the end of four years, we want them to be fluent speakers, readers, and writers of the Mohawk language. These are some of the activities. So as they're doing the activities, the masters and the teachers that are involved provide them with the language that they need in order to um, operate within that activity that they're doing. So if you take a look here, we would give them the word Lanjaseluni. And over here, Lanokwat Salagwas. And over here, Lakgah Laseluni. So we would provide them with the words and then they would have to repeat them and, and learn, that, learn it as hands on. Okay, now the top over here, you have. Uh, oh, my thing is. Jinion Kwadi Hoda. They're studying what they are practicing. Okay, some more pictures up here. When they go out, when they go out in the field, it's easier just to give them to provide the language because they're not sitting at a desk holding a pen or pencil. So this part is all oral. Okay, so here, he's uh, putting a hole in a, they're doing maple, the year that they did maple, so La Gaharunta, Yeyantos. Yes, she's tying up the, uh, uh, the branches. Yenokwat Saluni, Yegot Terizu, and La Diantos. So try this one, everybody. La diantos. La diantos. Ya go terizu. Everybody. Ya go terizu. Ya go te. Five syllables. Ya go terizu. So you can do a lot of like phonic work just in showing the pictures and give, pro providing them with the language that they need in order to operate in, to operate in these uh, areas. Okay, uh, you didn't laugh the you, Mary Arquid. Mary, can you stand? Mary is one of our apprentices in the, in the horticulture area. She's doing the horticulture with her group. She has four people working under her. She's learning and has learned a lot of the language. 
and she's passing it on to these four students that she has. We also um, look back into the culture, and uh, we're trying to um, include all our ceremonies. We go to the uh, longhouse in order to um, study the creation story, the great law, the Hondagaliwadehkwa. Uh, one, uh, one of our um, apprentices is doing a study on bees. That means the bee, the body of the bee. Okay, so he's um, harvesting bees and he's uh, taking care of the bees and he's uh, he's did write-ups on. This is the presentation that he made. Oh, we we didn't play more pictures. No, that's it. Okay. Um, Okay, he did a whole presentation on bees, and then he presented it to the class, all in the language. So any topic that you take, you can create it. And um, he learned it, he studied it, and he um, got all the words that he needed on the study of bees and presented it to the class to teach others. And he wants to go and teach it into the Freedom School. Okay, immersion, emergency, and urgency. When I was working on this presentation, I looked at what we've done in immersion, the emergency state that we're in, plus it's urgent that we do something about it. And don't give up, just keep going. Of 35,000 Mohawk people residing in all the communities that I mentioned, less than 1,000 are speakers. Immersion programs graduate a small number of functionally fluent students. Of the 12 language groups in Canada, only three are predicted to survive with no immediate intervention. Mohawk is not one of them. Yeah, I think the three, there's the Cree, Ojibwe, and Inuktitut. I think those are the three. And I think in certain spots too, they're experiencing this same loss. Now we are in a state of emergency and urgency. Our languages need to be spoken. What is needed? Re-education. Reestablish our language system using the immersion concept. Immersion methods assist us to enforce, strengthen, and reintroduce our native languages, our traditional beliefs, our culture, our values, and history. Education in our own ways, traditions, customs, our songs, our dances, our spirituality, our values, and our humor. I think we experienced that last night. There's a lot of humor in our languages, and we need to bring that back. We need to do a lot of laughing. Learn our ancestry, our role as women and men, and learn who we are as Zungwe Hungwe. Know and live by our own standards. We are really good at living up to standards from the outside and abiding by practices and standards other than our own. We're really good at it. So we need to reverse that. We need to reverse and live according to our standards. I'm surprised we survived this far. You know, we've, we've lived, bring the outside in and that's what we live by, you know. I appreciate and love ourselves. Love who we are as a people, our community and nation, okay? Really love. <laughs> <laughs> no, just take it out. <laughs> I'll call them back later. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't usually get phone calls. <laughs> um, again, I have a second time. What is a continuation? Reestablish the pride of who we really are and what we are about. Okay, so I find maybe um, as we went through our own education system, or we went through education, our pride was tampered with, I feel. Like it was, it was a lot of put downs. Even if we brought the language back in, into the school, it was a challenge. We need to take pride in speaking our own native language. 
Like give it all you got, you give it all you have, especially now, because it's so, uh, it's almost our language is immersed in English. There's so much English around. So you have to really be strong. We really have to be strong in order to bring our languages back to its rightful place. And let's be proud, proud and speaking it. Okay, in this day and age, it is urgent to speak to everyone, to get everyone involved within a community. Use it, speak it, flaunt it. Don't be afraid to flaunt it. <laughs> Reestablish our native language in its rightful status and place it within our hearts and minds. We can put it in all the computers you want. We can put it on all the CDs we want. We can put it on radio, but where we have to bring it back is in our hearts and in our minds in order for us to speak. Correct grammar and proper usage of the language and context, everyday language. I remember when I was growing up and I was, learn I was learning the language, I would hear elders or even my parents would say, it's not correct, you didn't use that correctly. Well, what's this? Well, teach me. Teach me how to say it correctly. And we can't be afraid anymore. We can't be afraid to ask our elders for the correct way to speak the language. Oh. <laughs> uh, Chris, you can just turn that off. Yeah. I'll call them back later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, we need to revive the language as a living language within our lives. And I do, and I do know it's a challenge. Even when we set up the immersion, no matter which community it was in, it was a challenge. There was a lot of attitudes. Our, our, to me, I thought it was going to be the easiest thing to do was to set up um, a curriculum and to teach our own people within our school systems. Because our school systems on the reserves are not um, native. It's a white system, and non-native teachers uh, it, teaching it. And when we tried to establish the immersion, a lot of people fought it. So that's the thing that, the attitude that you have to sort of like change, bring everybody on board, even our band councils. Our band councils need to be speakers. They need to realize that it's critical. If we lose our language, we lose who we are. Okay, our native language is our identity. Within it lies our history, our culture, our spiritual beliefs, our values, our songs, our stories, our legends. Within it lies our spiritual dances, our social dances. Within it lies our sense of humor. And we need to make this strong. We need to be, make this strong. We have to present it in a strong way. We need to bring everybody back on board. From the youngest to the oldest, the elders, everybody in the community needs to work on, we need to get everybody involved working on it. And I know there's some resistance, but even those who are resisting it, we need to present it in a way that we, we can convince them that our language has to be spoken. Little kids pick it up very fast. They do. And I think the elders, the adults do too. We just need to expose them more to the language. I know some will say it's too hard, I can't do it. They just need more exposure. If it's one word, if it's a whole paragraph, they need more exposure. A struggle. Communities are struggling to revive language, to keep it alive within their lives through courses and family gatherings. We need to keep the language alive everywhere. We need to make our language popular and meaningful. 
and we need to restore the pride within our language. And we need the resources to accomplish it. We need to go after the finances in order to reestablish these programs and to reestablish the school systems on, in our communities. And our kids do really well. I know the um, program that we did in um, Kahnawage. When I was teaching the grade one, it wasn't a total immersion. When we first started, I, I did about three quarters of the day in the language. In the last hour, I did, I did one hour of English. Cause some of the parents, and it wasn't so much the parents in the, who were involved in the immersion that were concerned. It was the parents who did not want immersion. And so the school committee uh, hired the um, professors from McGill to come in and uh, test the students. And they tested them in English. I said, why are you testing them in English when they've been in Mohawk immersion for almost three years? So anyways, I let it go. The professors came in and they tested the students uh, in English. And uh, when the results came back, the, st the students in the immersion outscored the three other classes who were, had been in English for three years. And the only section that was a bit weak was the spelling, which is understandable for spelling. But um, they caught up, but the rest of the scores, they, they outscored them in science, social studies, math, and language arts. So, and we have those test results, they're on file. But our kids do really well. The other thing I noticed in doing that immersion program, when we got it right up to grade six, with our students, we had no discipline problems because the parents were involved. They took care of the discipline. And the kids came out in that immersion program being very polite. And I think even our immersion program in, um, on the American side of our reserve, the Akwazasta Freedom School, our kids are very nice. That's one thing I noticed. And they would come up to you and say, because within the language, there's a polite way of addressing people, and that's taught to the kids. There's the, um, they would say something like, Okay, so it says, says, may I speak with you? They won't just charge in and say, I have something to say. So, so you see the difference? Because that, that respect and the politeness is right in the language, and that's what you've you're teaching your, your little ones. I remember when I was principal of that immersion school, this one kid, I, I saw this knock at the door. So I looked, he poked his head inside the door, and he said, Awadaga, can I speak with you? Awadaga, the Dinitana. He left his school bag at home, and he was going on a field trip. So we had to go and get it. So that type of politeness is what was happening in those immersion, in immersion schools. They didn't just charge in on you. And that pride and um, the meaningfulness of the language came back to those little ones. So immersion. As I said, our languages are in that state now where we need to um, take some strong measures in order to bring it back to our people. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.